to become the man she sees and believes in. Without her, this book would never have come to fruition. I love you all. And I think Jim loved all of us, all of us, in his own way. I'll tell you, I'll miss Washington. I'll miss Brother Jim. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I am Dr. Shawanda Riley, and I'm part of the Dallas Weekly family. I have been a columnist for the Weekly since, oh, I think it was the early 2000s, and I met, I always called him Mr. Washington when I worked at a radio station, and he had a radio show, and I was the producer, and from those conversations at the radio station, he invited me to be a columnist for the Weekly, and I'm honored to still be able to remain a part of that family. Um, and so it's appropriate that I follow Mr. Campbell, who read the spiritually speaking columns that Mr. Washington shared in the weekly, um, because I'm going to offer a prayer. And we know that prayer is an important part of our lives, and it was an important part of his life as well. So I would just ask that you would bow your heads. All right. Heavenly Father, we gather today to celebrate the life of James Jim Washington. We honor his life of compassion, integrity, thoughtfulness, and grace. Strengthen us as we come together in sorrow and give us comfort as we share memories and laughter of Jim. We're thankful for his life and for the impact on the community. And today, we continue to celebrate his legacy. His legacy will continue to inspire and guide us. We thank you for your presence today, Lord. We know and believe beyond any doubt that your power and your love will never fail. Bless this gathering today. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand praise today. Hallelujah. For God is so good and he is so worthy to be praised. To the Washington family, my prayers and condolences are with you and with everyone here today celebrating the life of Mr. Washington. Hallelujah. Precious Lord, take, take my hand and lead, lead me on, let me stand. Oh, I'm tired and I, I am weak. Lord, you know I am worn through, through, through the storm. Lead me on to your light. Lord, please take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. When my way grows so dreary, oh, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is all, almost. Almost, almost 
Precious Lord, and lead, lead me on. Here, I said, here, hear my cry. my call. Lord, Lord, please take my hand, lest I fall. Lord, please take my hand, precious Lord. Precious Lord, precious Lord, and leave, and leave. Hallelujah. Take my hand. Take my hand. And leave. Come on and lead your child on home. Hallelujah. Amen. We need some leading every now and then. Um, yeah. So um, we're at the point where we are going to hear resolutions. We have three um, that are going to be read uh, in our hearing. And we also have one from the city of Dallas um, that is uh, from the office of uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, Carolyn King Arnold. Uh, it will not be read on today. Are there any others that are present uh, with resolutions that you would like for us to present to the family? You can bring those to me. It'll be my pleasure uh, to do that, or you can see them afterwards. And then let me also uh, make mention, uh, you know what? I'll do that in a moment. I will do that in a moment. And so uh, let's have uh, come to uh, the microphone, first of all, the um, president of the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce in the person of Harrison Blair. He'll be followed by uh, Brother Vincent, Uncle Vinny Hall, and then uh, by Kelvin Bass. And so if you can make your, uh, actually you can uh, just position yourselves close to the front so that you can make your way up here pretty quickly. That'll be awesome when it is your turn. I uh, will make that happen. And so let's give a hand uh, if you will, for uh, the president of the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce. So, uh, quickly, uh, I don't think we have the resolution up here. Oh, this is this is the resolution. Okay, thank you. I don't think. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate you. Um, before I get started, I just. Coming from a family of journalists and folks who do media in this, in this city, 
it's very important to just take a moment to pay homage to Mr. Washington because he was a black journalist. He told stories that you couldn't get anywhere but from black community. And he did it for us, even if it cost him greatly. So I'm honored to be able to stand here as a legacy of a family who did that kind of work and to pay homage to a man who has really been a pioneer in media. And now I want to read some words from the Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, Carolyn King Arnold. Whereas James A. Washington earned his bachelor's degree in English and instructional media from Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, he also earned a master's degree in journalism from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Washington has also been involved in nearly every level of communications for over four decades. And whereas Washington served as the publisher of the Dallas Weekly, a black owned and operated publication, he also worked as the public relations manager for the Dallas Ballet. He served on several boards such as the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, the Dallas Arboretum, the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, and whereas he is a former tri-chair of Dallas's Commission on Race Relations and Dallas Together Forum. He was also a former member of the Federal Reserve Bank's Small Business and Agriculture Advisory Committee in Dallas. Washington was named Man of the Year in 1986 by the Metropolitan Club of Negro Business and Professional Women and a professor at Tennessee State University and Paul Quinn College. He served as a news director at KALO radio station in Little Rock, Arkansas, as well as a PR specialist for the American Heart Association before co-founding Focus Communications and acquiring the Dallas Weekly in 1980. And whereas Washington has been honored for his outstanding community service by organizations such as Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Lynx Incorporated, the United Way, Dallas Independent School District, Martin Luther King Jr. Center, Daniel Chappie James Learning Center, the NAACP, KKDA, which my family listened to every morning, KRLD radio station, Dallas Black Dance Theater, Dallas Museum of Arts and Culture, and the State Fair of Texas. He was a member of several journalism organizations, including the Texas Publishing Association, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, and the, Nas the National Association of Black Journalists. And whereas Washington was also the author of the book, Spiritually Speaking, of which you heard some reflections from today, Reflections for and from a New Christian, which gives spiritual insight into the new Christian and answers questions like, why me? He understands the answer uh, is and always has been, why not you? And whereas James A. Washington is survived by his wife, Janice Ware Washington, publisher of the, of the Atlanta Voice, their passion for the black press brought them together in 2003, not only as life partners, but also business partners. He is also survived by his daughter, Elena Bonifay, and son, Patrick Washington, grandchildren, and a host of family and friends. Now, therefore, I, Carolyn King Arnold, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem of District 4 for the City of Dallas on May 4th, 2024, and the members of District 4 Council extend our deepest sympathies and prayer to Janice Ware and the Washington family. Thank you. Good morning. George McDonald says, it is a greater compliment to be trusted than to be a friend. First, I want to offer Commissioner Price's condolences. He could not be here today. Uh, we've got uh, something going on with Parkland over here, right on the other side of the street, and he has gotten tied up in that. But he did love Jim Washington. As a matter of fact, uh, that was the way that I ended up on the paper at the Dallas Weekly. John called, uh, he called Jim Washington in December of 2002. In January 1st of 2003, I had my first article. I don't know what they said to each other. And I don't know how, uh, how many expletives were in it. But somehow, uh, Jim took a chance on somebody like me. And I can tell you that he was one of the most wonderful people that I ever met. At some point, 
he never told me he loved me, but he trusted me. And that's what really meant a lot. I didn't know until the day that he was from IBM, but now it all makes sense. Because I grew up in at and and I kind of know what the corporate background looks like. And one time, he called me over to the office. He said, Vincent, he said, I need you to come to the office. He didn't tell me what it was. He said, come to the office. I said, okay. I got there. He said, I just got through with some attorney screaming at me, talking about how they're going to sue this paper for what you wrote. And to this day, I cannot remember who it was. I probably wrote something about Dwayne Carraway or Sandra Crenshaw or Betty Cobra. It was something. It was ugly. And he said, man, I cannot believe you did that. I trusted you. I'm not even, I'm not even editing your stuff. So, you know, you got to be careful. So we talked about it. We laughed for a little while. And on my way out the door, he said, come back here. There's two things I need to tell you. I said, what? He said, you just won a journalism award, and I appreciate that, despite all the hell you bring to me. He said, and then get the rest of the hate mail out of your box on your way out. I trusted Jim Washington. Jim Washington trusted me. That's better than love. Good morning. My name is Kelvin Bass. Um, I'm here in, a, in an official capacity um, on behalf of State Senator Royce West, who has presented a proclamation, has prepared a proclamation. Uh, but I'm also here because I'm also an alum of the Dallas Weekly. It was the most fun and rewarding three years uh, that I could encapsulate of my life. Uh, giving honor to God first, I am in church. I was raised right. <laughs> the shepherd of this house, the ministers who are on the rostrum. I just look across and see a lot of people that I know and have history with. My condolences, of course, to the Washington family. I'll say for all of the reasons and qualities about Jim Washington that we'll hear about today. Jim Washington is and will remain one of my favorite people. He's a good man, talented, fair, intelligent, community-minded, philosophical, and thoughtful, of course. So we did order the proclamation. Um, the official parchment proclamation is somewhere between here and Austin. All our proclamations get done in Austin. It did not, uh, I, I don't think that the governor put any barriers or barbed wire across I-35. <laughs> so it'll get here and it will be framed and presented to you. Senate proclamation in memory of James Washington. The Senate of the state of Texas honors and commemorates the life of James Washington, who died April 2, 2024, at the age of 73. Whereas born in Macomb, Mississippi, James grew up in Chicago and graduated with honors from the renowned De La Salle Institute. He followed the tradition set by his mother, father, and older brother, Frank, and attended Southern University and A&M College in Baton Rouge, where he earned a degree in English and instructional media. Whereas, and I'm skipping through the proclamation, whereas in 1981 he co-founded Focus Communication, a public relations firm that continues to operate in Dallas, and the firm later acquired the Dallas Weekly. James served at the, as the publisher for the widely acclaimed, award-winning newspaper for more than 30 years before passing the leadership role onto his son in 2019. Throughout his career, James was a trusted and devoted mentor to many young journalists and entrepreneurs, and he taught journalism at Paul Quinn College in addition to providing scholarships and internships for countless students. In 2019, he was honored with the Legacy Award from the National Association of Black Journalists for his outstanding membership and 
whereas an exemplary citizen and community leader, James' professional and personal accomplishments were recognized with numerous accolades and awards from a wide range of esteemed local and national organizations. And he was involved extensively in supporting the arts, education, entrepreneurship, and positive social change in the Dallas community. Whereas a devoted husband, father, and grandfather, James gave unselfishly to others, and his dedication to his profession, his mentorship, and his outstanding service on behalf of his community have made a meaningful impact in the lives of innumerable people. His memory will be forever cherished by his family and many friends and by all who were privileged to share in his life. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Senate of the State of Texas hereby extends sincere condolences to the bereaved family of James Washington and be it further proclaimed that a copy of this proclamation be prepared for his family as an expression of deepest sympathy from the Texas Senate. The copy you all get will be signed by Royce West. Thank you for your time. God bless. Amen. All right. We're about to engage in uh, special remarks. And you'll notice that there is not a place on the program uh, for persons to come um, ad hoc, as so often is the case. Um, if you have some uh, wonderful, encouraging, uplifting stories to share uh, about uh, James A. Washington, uh, you'll have opportunity to do that with the family immediately following the memorial service for just a few moments as we'll gather out in the narthex area. For now, we have some special remarks, prepared remarks, that we'll hear from uh, persons who are making their way, come this way. Uh, first by Earl Nye, retired chairman of Texas Utilities, followed by Charles O'Neill, Ron Kirk, Helen Giddings, Representative Helen Giddings, Gordon Jackson, Cheryl Smith, Roland Martin, and uh, Sherilyn K. Smith before. Uh, we'll have a quick insertion at that point, and then followed, last but not least, by Patrick and Jessica Washington. And so, uh, hear these special remarks from these special guests. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you all. Good morning. As many Pearl says, I'm just so proud to be here. I, uh, I do consider this a great honor. Uh, Jim Washington was a special man, special friend. I met Jim in the 80s, I'm not quite sure when, but we sat down at a table at some community event, made a friendship which lasted the remainder of our lives. We made a commitment to have breakfast at least quarterly. We had breakfast quarterly or more often at 7.30. That was Jim's requirement. I don't do 7.30, <laughs> but, but uh, we met regularly and we cured all the sins of the world and made some progress. Jim was special. Uh, he, he was such a good man, but it's one of those things that I learned after I agreed to make these comments that I had two minutes. There's no way I'm going to cover what I'd like to say about Jim Washington in two minutes. Uh, the mayor, ambassador, doctor, whatever else, uh, Ron Kirk told me that's an aspirational goal and uh, nothing more. Uh, in the 80s, everyone in this room will know that, surfaced, that certain issues surfaced uh, that needed to be taken care of, probably much earlier than that. But many leaders stepped forward, many in this room, and I can see many of them, stepped forward to deal with issues of equity, convenience, economic equity, employment, business access, and what have you. Jim was very instrumental in that. Jim was a great leader. He, he was not only a great leader, he was a visionary. I watched as he patiently, sometimes not so patiently. By the way, I've understood that someone said that he was a token. Jim Washington was a lot of things, but he wasn't a token. He made himself known, but he was always ultimately polite. 
Jim was a visionary. Jim was a bright person. We all know that. But Jim, beyond that, was wise. He had a depth of knowledge and information about people that was unique, and he used it to all of our advantage. Uh, Jim was personable. He was easy to meet, friendly, and what have you. But he had a deep abiding desire for all people, and he carried that forward through his leadership. Uh, Jim had a good sense of humor. He could tell a story. He couldn't tell it very short, but he could tell a story. <laughs> and uh, he used those stories to sort of dissolve anger. If, if a meeting got to a little awkward point, people were a little unhappy and with one another, Jim came up with a story. And it always fit. And it defused the situation. Jim was a devout person. We know that. Uh, you've had readings from his book. But the thing about that, a lot of us are devout, hopefully. But Jim lived his religion. You didn't need to read his book. You know what he thought. You know what he believed. And you know how he carried himself. I guess it goes without saying, he was a man of strong character, explicitly honest, honorable, honest, caring, and he did so much for this city. You all know that he was a, a very talented writer. You know that he was a great publisher. He was a good businessman. He loved his family. He carried his family with his heart. And he did very much for this city. And you probably don't know how much Jim did because he was more than happy to let anybody take credit as long as he moved us in the right direction. And he did that on a regular basis. I count it a privilege to have known Jim. Uh, he was a special friend. I will say that he carried himself in a fashion where he never, I never saw him criticize anyone. And he told me one time, don't do that. That just gets in the way of what we need to do. Uh, if you have to deal with a jerk, just go ahead and do it and get, get where we need to go. And if you can't get all you need, take what you can get. We'll come back and get it later. Uh, Jim was special. I thank you for this opportunity. I do have a mental image of my mind of Jim Washington up in heaven. And he's got St. Peter by the ear. And he's helping him reorganize the <laughs> choir so that everyone can sit on the front row. Thank you and God bless you. Good morning. Uh, I think in the program it says um, Charles O'Neill, president of the Texas Association of African American Chambers of Commerce, but I may be the oldest alumnus of the Dallas Weekly. I went to work for Tony Davis back in 1975. I had fro back those days, and I spent the next 20 years in the newspaper business here in Dallas. Uh, let me say first, though, thank you to Janice and Patrick and Elena and Jessica and Vicky for this honor. You know, uh, Jim was my friend. Our relationship was a testament to, uh, that friends don't always agree on the route. If getting there is what's important, getting there for Jim and me is getting to a healthy, vibrant black world guided by a healthy, vibrant black press. And through the twists and turns of life, our friendship endured, and the world will miss his wit, his vision, and his stalwart commitment to black people. And when 
And Jim added, uh, spiritually speaking, to his repertoire. I realized he had taken a turn that many of us dare not take. That road led him to the peace that we all seek and his undaunted bravery in the face of life's challenges. His tireless work to the end makes me proud to say Jim was my friend. Now, one of the benefits of being around a long time, I tell folk all the time, this is not a cosmetic gray beard. <laughs> we get to watch the twists and turns of life. And, and there may be people here today who didn't know that Jim, before he was a newspaper man, he was already a leader in Dallas. People may not know that when he and Ken Carter started Focus Communications, Jim had already started carving out a leadership role in this city. Focus Communications, a remarkable first, Ken, a black-owned PR and marketing firm in Dallas. So Jim was already working before the newspaper business, uh, at, at working and changing the minds and hearts long before he and the late great Tony Davis reached an agreement to keep the flame of the Dallas Weekly burning bright. Like everything else he did, Jim attacked building the brand of the Weekly with his style of wit and charm and plain old smarts with the goal of distinguishing the Weekly in a marketplace with at least four other black-owned publications among those that I was associated with. So how good a job did Jim do with making sure that the weekly was the distinguished beyond the others? I can't count the times I was called Mr. Washington. You know, tall, glasses, beard, black newspaper guy. So, so, so Jim was phenomenal at what he did and, and he was indeed a master of branding. So incredibly, this year marks 30 years that I've been out of the newspaper business. And across those years, I had a son, Jim had a son. I had a daughter, Jim had a daughter. And I can remember visits with Jim and how he was glowing with pride to have Patrick and Jessica running through the office and running things in the office and how proud he was of that fact. And I'll end on this note in my Black Chamber of Commerce hat. Jim was among all the other things that you've heard and will hear about today, he was a great businessman. He understood the balance required to keep commercial viability in an industry constantly excluded from the livelihood of publishing, and that's advertising. And he understood how critical succession planning is to the long-term success of black-owned businesses so well that he pulled it off in two cities and trusting Patrick to build his own legacy here in Dallas at the Weekly while joining Janice, herself a second generation business owner at the Atlanta Voice. Jim served all of black America with his vision, his intellect, his business acumen, and we all benefited from his life of service. Jim graced me with his friendship and I'll miss him. <laughs> to Vicki and Janice and the family, thank you so much for giving me the honor to be a part of honoring Jim. Uh, the challenge is so much of what I want to say has been said. Um, but as Matrice and I were thinking about this and what made Jim special, I kept thinking Jim had four superpowers. Two of whom you've heard about was his humor and his kindness. But the one thing that I just couldn't get away from was Jim's strength as a listener. Not everybody has the ability to convene people from so many different walks of life like Jim did. And what gave him the ability to do that was Jim listen. Now, I'm a sports fan. I was 
screaming last night at the Mavericks. I'll be screaming at the Stars tonight. But I got hooked on Ted Lasso. And I've watched all of those, and that was a quote to me that just sums up what made Jim special. And those of you who watch Ted Lasso know what I'm talking about. But where he quotes, they say Walt Whitman, but nobody knows who wrote it. But the quote challenged us to be curious and not judgmental. And as I thought about Jim, that was one of his superpowers. And Matrice said what she loved about Jim was when Jim asked you a question, it's because he really wanted to know what you thought and how you felt about something so he could better understand it as opposed to many of us, particularly in today's environment, we ask you a question, but we're formulating our response the whole time. And what Jim taught us was to listen. And not talking is not equivalent to listening. Listening is about empathy. Listening is about learning. And so the reason you see so many people here from so many walks of life honoring Jim was his ability to convene us and bring us to the table and get us to listen. Secondly, Jim was cool. Charles O'Neill talked about it, but it wasn't a bad day in your life if somebody con confused you with Jim, Jim Washington. You know, he had the little half row, he had the beard, he was a renaissance man, he's a businessman, he was a publisher, he'd been in the music building. But as Earl referenced, the one great thing about Jim, when you were in those rooms and the conversations got challenging and difficult, Jim was almost a human thermometer because his demeanor rarely changed. Jim never got too high, he never got too low, and just his presence, the way he moderated those conversations, just sort of invited everybody to chill, take it down a level. We're here to serve, solve problems and learn from one another, and that's what Jim allowed us to do. And you've heard about his humor. And I told Matrice, I don't, she said, do you remember anything he said? I said to me, too many times he laughed and go, no, we ain't going to do that. You know? <laughs> and somehow I never felt bad about it because he, he did it in a way that helped me to understand that we had to use our talents, to, as Earl say, always to keep the ball moving. And so I would ask of you and invite you to help honor Jim, because the last thing I think about him, he cared so much about publishing because he loved us. And he understood without the black press, our stories don't get told. And we don't get that knowledge that we did. And Jim and I would laugh, you know, about both growing up in the South and that horrible saying that they used to always say in the barbershops on Saturday, you know, we'd be talking about something going on that somebody would always go, I don't know. And one of those old seniors would always say, well, if you don't want black people to know something, put it in the paper, put it in the book. Well, let's not make that mistake. If you want to honor Jim, I invite you to do three things. Pick up a book. Secondly, subscribe to and support the black press. We are needed now more than we ever have been before. And finally, and Pastor, you were kind enough. I think you call me ambassador, mayor, sector. But once, once a black man from the South, always a black man from the South. When you leave here, you can go next door and vote. You have no excuse not to. But Jim, to the family, we thank you for the gift of this brilliant, cool, calm, powerful brother that was and always will be James Washington. Thank you. Good morning. I am so very honored to have the opportunity to pay tribute to the extraordinary life of a special friend of 40 years, Jim Washington. And like everybody else, I'm challenged by this two minutes to sum up what Jim meant to me, what he meant to Dallas, and what he meant to the world. Jim was a giant whose calling card was leadership, service, integrity, 
Jim always met me with this huge coast-to-coast -coast smile. He could not have always been that happy. But regardless, Brenda Jackson, you remember, the signature smile was always there. If we went for a year without seeing one another, when we met, we just picked up where we left off. Our friendship started when we both served as members of the board of the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce. And over the years, our friendship deepened as we served together on Dallas Together, the Dallas Alliance, United Way, and the Dallas Assembly, to name a few. And I did op-eds for the weekly for about a year, so I guess I'm a member of the weekly family as well. Tom Donning, you and I marveled last week about how thought-provoking Jim could be and how he could put that opposing view on the table without offending you and sometimes you ended up thinking that the idea was yours all along. Yeah, Jim was that polished. He was a loving father and husband, great business person, community leader, and a trusted friend. Jim was indeed a man for all seasons. And speaking of seasons, Jim's spiritual season began when he was 51 in this church. And as Greg has told you and read from his book, one of the chapters in that book is called, It's All About the Dash, and this is what Jim said, and I quote, I just think it's a beautiful thing to be able to influence the dash between the dates of our physical birth and our physical death. We have no control over those two points, life and death, but that dash will serve us well for our eternity. It will be what makes our obituary. And so play it, pay attention. And obviously, Jim paid attention to that dash because his life made a meaningful difference in the lives of so many others. His life will continue to inspire and encourage us to serve God, to serve one another, foster community, push boundaries, dream bigger, and reach further. Jim, you're gone way, way too soon, and all of us want to cry, but we're going to smile as best we can and celebrate and be grateful to God because we had you, Jim, and we're all better because we had you. You will forever live in our hearts, and we just ask that God would bless Jim Washington's soul and that he would be ever-present in the lives of his family and his friends, and we will be very careful to make sure that God gets the credit for that life for which he richly deserves. Amen. And good afternoon. I want to send my best wishes to Janice and family, um, and uh, I'm so glad to see a lot of uh, the warriors that rode shotgun with me when I was editor. I, uh, now I'm not going to call out any names because I might miss somebody, but I just, you know who you are, and I want to thank you and be honored for sharing the foxhole with me during, my, during those times. Uh, speaking of those times, <laughs> I served as managing editor, senior reporter, and general assignment reporter under Jim at the Dallas Weekly for a total of nine and a half years over three different time phases. <laughs> <laughs> we were as bad as George Steinbrenner and Billy Martin with the New York Yankees, if you remember those times. And I counted it. Uh, that made a total of 436 issues, thus 436 deadlines, up us up between 250 and 300 cover stories, and thousands of other uh, articles and content. My comments is in the back of the program. Some of my comments uh, you can read. Jim exhibited from my memories, from my vantage point, a quiet greatness within himself. 
He regularly carried himself with a distinct style of dignity and grace, while at the same time fighting and winning the wars, both internal and external, that often challenged the Dallas Weekly's relevancy in both the black and mainstream community. Now, the fascinating thing about Jim is that all those years and all those issues and deadlines that uh, I worked with him through, he seldom, or I, I don't think ever, he yelled, never ranted, never bellowed, never got in my face, never freaked out in front of me, at least in front of me. I don't know if he did that with any of y'all. But he also successfully and eloquently knew how to let us know when he was mad, angry, disappointed, disheartening, or when we needed a talking to from time to time. We did cl clash, okay, more than once. You know, we, we did disagree. We did have opposing viewpoints on matters in the community or on how the Dallas Weekly should be run and managed. So, you know, he won all those battles. <laughs> and, but looking back, my concluding analysis of this is that we both had the same passion to achieve excellence, but with different methodologies. And because we both wanted to strive for excellence. Um, another quiet and smooth way that he operated, now you know, myself, Cheryl Smith, Roland Martin, other editors, we worked our you know what off putting out these hard-hitting, award-winning, thought-provoking cover stories week after week. But still, overall, the one, number one reason most people wanted to go pick up the Dallas Weekly was because of his spiritual speaking columns. So that became humbling when, once you realized that. So, so here, we, here we are, the major question. How do we preserve Jim Washington's legacy and name? Now, it's been discussed before by a couple of previous remarks, but I'd like to put just a little bit more emphasis on that. One clear, distinct way is for us to drive every ounce of our consciousness and love for our community to celebrate, support, and help finance any form of what is considered the black press. That last, that's a key last word, finance. Whether it not be, you know, it's in many forms now. It could be in print, online, radio, television, podcasts, social media, blogging, or whatever forms out there. Uh, more critically, as an individual or a company or business, if you are among those, drive monetary support and backing to institutions like the Dallas Weekly, the Atlanta Voice, uh, Texas Metro News, Roland Martin Unfiltered, or all of the above. And, and I'll do so through traditional advertising, digital advertising, subscriptions, likes, shares, simply word of mouth, or all of the above. This is important. I'm not just, uh, just sitting here just playing. And that's simply because you need to put your money where your mouth is and put your money in the black press somehow, some way, stop quibbling uh, on maybe the quality or value of what the black press uh, produces or its role in the black and mainstream community. If you don't like what you're seeing, call them out on the table. But when they do produce content that's positive, accurate, cutting edge, and uplifting, which happens many more times than some people care to admit, shout it from the rooftops. Tell everybody. If we do that, <clears throat> then I think we could be assured that Jim Washington will be smiling down on us from above. That's extremely important to note because now, as Ron Kirk said, now more than ever the black press is needed. The times we're going through right now with our racial climate though it vindicated the work of Jim Washington and the black press, but we need to carry it forward. So remember, Jim Washington, by understanding the term that black narratives matter. Once again, 
black narratives matter. And you got to support it, and you got to finance it, too. I consider Jim Washington as a consummate Renaissance brother, and I probably consider him myself as a Jim Washington disciple. God bless you, Jim. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wow. For a minute there, I said, who are they talking about? And I expected that um, he's not here today, but I thought I would get hooked up like Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III, and I'd just be able to just walk out here and talk and strut. But um, this mic is OK. I have to start by saying, uh, so much to talk about, so little space. And Jim Washington could talk and talk and talk. In two minutes, what can I say? I'm Cheryl Smith, and I became acquainted with the Dallas Weekly in the mid-'80s. And um, I want to begin by saying thank you to the family. And David. You are one lucky person because I used to work at the Dallas Weekly and I had my little nephew. And I had to work late. And so Jim wouldn't say, go home, take care of your family or whatever. He would took my family home with him. And Eleni and Andre used to sleep in the, in the closet together. And, um, and I said, maybe he's trying to set her up for a future. And maybe he's making that connection, that African thing. But he was saving her for you. And Andre's doing well, too. But I have to say thank you. Thank you to the family. Thank you to Vicki for you all embracing me. Because how many of you can say you love your boss? And I actually loved him, and you weren't threatened by it. Because you said nobody could love more than I or <laughs> whatever. But you said we embrace you too, and that's really important. And then decades later, Janice came on, and you have to understand, I worked for the Dallas Weekly in the 80s, and left in the 90s, in 2000s, in 2010. And when I started my own newspaper, someone had the unmitigated gall to tell me I should name it Cheryl Smith because no one would know me because they know me as the Dallas Weekly. And they wanted me because it has such an imprint. And even as late as 2015, someone gave me a check made out to the Dallas Weekly. <laughs> And I said, Jim Washington would love this, but I can't do anything with it. But, um, but thank you for being that family and embracing me and letting me do things and, um, and do things with that loved one of yours. Because I walked into his office and told him, I can't believe it. I'm going to say, and I did say to him, and this is a message for any of you, if you have anything to say to anyone who has been in your life, Say it now. I did apologize to him because I can't believe some of the stuff I said to Jim Washington. And he did recite. He said, you said, if I put everything you want in the paper, no one will read it. I said, OK. And, but when I first walked in, I said, let me show you what I can do with this paper. And he let me do it. And I didn't pay attention to it when I left. One of the times I left, but um, I understand what he was saying now, and you know I so I have mad love for him for his family, and I am the Dallas Weekly. I don't care where I go, I am the Dallas Weekly, and I'm going to be there. He was my journalism father, and. I appreciate him. I appreciate the black press. Jim, I wore this blue because he was from Southern University, and I'm from Florida A&M, and we could have some battles. And, uh, but I said, let me do it for him. You know, it, was, it, it hurt, but, but I did it. It was in honor of him. I mean, I'm still shaking my head saying, I don't believe you did this. And he played with me this morning because I tried to act like I was young like you all, and I put notes in here. And then Shawanda was trying to help me find them. I couldn't find the notes. So 
I was like, I have to ad lib. I have to come up with, with something to say. And you know, I'm not as young as, as I thought, you know. So, um, but I want to say thanks to a lot of people. So that's why I'm asking if you have ever had your name written in the Dallas Weekly, and uh, stand for Jim. Stand for Jim. If, you, if your name has ever appeared in the Dallas Weekly. You know. And thank you. And I'm asking you to stand because guess what that is indicative of? That means he stood for you. He stood for you. And, you know, I, I can't go without saying that. Uh, Jim, I thank him for his faith in me and us, his love, his love of community journalism and HBCUs. And the doors of the weekly were open for everyone. And I'm just going to tell you a shameless pitch. You can read anything I wrote about him in Texas Metro News so that I can get off in my two minutes time. But I'd like to say if there are members of the National Association of Black Journalists here, if you would stand. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now the National Newspaper Publishers Association, the first time Jim asked me did I want to go, I said no. And now I do believe he was so proud to know now that I serve on a national board. And, and I think he considers me his child. When I ran for office with NABJ, he was always there with me. And, uh, and it's just, but I love him. I loved him for being there for me. Now, I have something for the family, and this is going to go into the new home of the Dallas Weekly. And so I'm going to ask, we have our national, we have our national chair of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, Bobby Henry, and the deputy publisher of the Garland Journal, Stuart Corrett. And Bobby is my classmate from FAMU. And, um, he didn't have to go to class because his daddy owned the newspaper, the West Side Gazette in Fort Lauderdale. I had to be at every class for him. Now, but this is a piece of art. There's an artist that appeared on the cover of the Dallas Weekly named Curtis Ferguson. And I want to share this with you if I make my last remarks and if you will unveil it. And um, from this FAMU Rattler to proud Southern Jaguar, thanks for pouring into our lives. We, journalism, and the world have benefited significantly from you, your blessings, everything you shared. And he told me, what he told me, he said, there will never be another editor. There will be a managing editor. There will be, never be another editor. So, from your editor-in-chief, Cheryl Smith, Jim Washington, I love you, and I appreciate you for being my journalism father. Hey folks, Roland Martin here. Sorry I could not be with you uh, in Dallas today. I am giving the commencement speech at Wilberforce University in Ohio. I certainly wanted to be there. It's been a long time since I've seen many of my uh, former colleagues at the Dallas Weekly. Uh, and, um, and I'm sure uh, many of you uh, are uh, saying uh, heartwarming, uh, some sad. I hope lots of, of fun loving stories about uh, Jim Washington. Uh, yes, uh, in order for this video I did crack out uh, my Dallas week, Weekly jacket so you see you know I got I got the logo on the back here so uh, I decided to go ahead and put this on for the video. Um, what can I say uh, about uh, Jim Washington? First off, um, um, my time as managing editor of the Dallas Weekly was uh, some of the greatest uh, moments I've had in my career. No lie. 
no lie. Um, 13 months there, and the conversations that Jim and I would often have, uh, because I, I stayed late. A lot of times he would uh, he would go out to events and would come back to the paper, and it might be uh, eight, nine, ten o'clock. I was still there, uh, and so we had um, uh, lots of conversations. Conversations, obviously, about work. Conversations about family. A lot of conversations uh, about faith. Um, uh, we would, uh, you know, he would when he he was sitting in the conference room. We would we would have those uh, discussions going there, and uh, those conversations might go for uh, one, two, three hours. Um, it was it, it was always great because Jim gave me the autonomy um, and to um, to take the Dallas Weekly where I thought it should go. Um, he did not. Um, I'm, I, I was sitting here thinking earlier today. I, I can't think of a situation where he made me run a story. Uh, he made me take something off the front page. Um, he, he trusted my instincts. Um, uh, it, it's funny. I'm sitting here having this digital show because uh, I was uh, pushing uh, Jim real hard uh, on the internet in 1998. Uh, the things that we're doing today, I was seeing back then and was like, man, we got to do this. We got to do this here. Uh, we will often have lots of conversations about uh, black newspapers, and black owned media, um, business conversations, advertising conversations. And, and that was one of the things that uh, I thought was, was, was great and important because uh, we didn't just have a um, managing editor bought, you know, CEO sort of relationship, uh, there was mutual respect uh, on both sides. Uh, I remember he would, <laughs> he would always, uh, I was always about uh, winning, beating the competition. He would always go, uh, Mr. Martin, uh, why is it that you keep wanting to, want to take out my competitors? And I would say, Jim, we can't charge what we should be charging for full page ads because we ain't getting advertising money, we getting community relations money. And he would just start laughing. Uh, and the battle continues today. Um, it, it continues today. Um, you know, Jim uh, was a absolutely uh, great man. Uh, he was someone, I, I, I always, even when I, I left the weekly and I came back, uh, I would often, when I was in Dallas, would go by and visit. And we would talk, um, catch up, talk about all sorts of uh, different things, uh, and and you know, you know, it was uh, it hit me definitely when um, I got the word that uh, he had um, um, had gotten sicker uh, and uh, was transitioning. Uh, but also I had uh, the distinction of actually knowing his brother Frank before him. Uh, I joined National Association of Black Journalists in 1989. Uh, and so I actually knew Frank Washington before I met Jim Washington. And then, of course, later run the Dallas Weekly. Uh, and, and knowing both of them, uh, always talking, chatting with both of them, communicating with both of them. Uh, and so uh, he was someone who... Uh, who loved black people, who understood why our stories mattered, who understood why black ownership matters. Uh, and so uh, Dallas, Atlanta, and this world is better off uh, with uh, Jim Washington and what he did in it. And so he'll certainly be sorely missed. Uh, and uh, I will uh, definitely, uh, uh, this will never leave my possession. Uh, and I will always look fondly uh, on those memories of, of being in Dallas and those conversations. And, and I'll probably say the greatest thing that um, came out of our relationship was our faith conversations uh, and Jim uh, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, and he often wrote about that. And, 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 and like I say, we had a lot, a lot of uh, deep philosophical conversations uh, about faith and meditation and, and prayer. Uh, and so 
uh, that probably stands out more than anything else when I look back uh, on our relationship. Uh, certainly condolences uh, to, uh, to Janice, his wife, to his children, to all of his friends and family. Uh, and uh, let's, let's, let's just remember Jim uh, as that uh, uh, tall, lanky dude with a funny walk uh, who uh, would always uh, have a, a distinct laugh uh, when uh, it would be a funny story, you could hear that laugh all throughout the building. And so we will certainly miss uh, Jim Washington uh, immensely. Folks, uh, y'all be well and be blessed. I want to give honor to the ministers of the pulpit. Uh, Dr. Crenshaw and Reverend White. I would also like to give honor to the family, which I think I'm a part of. <laughs> My name is Sherilyn Smith. I will try to get through without crying. <laughs> I worked for Mr. Washington uh, as a photographer. I was his assistant. I was a receptionist and I was the director of marketing. I was a young girl from Pleasant Grove. My mother was a homemaker, my father was an engineer. I remember growing up and wishing for certain things, desiring certain things that Pleasant Grove didn't offer. My aunt that's present uh, had a dream. I grew up in a family that was very biblical based. It was faith, it was what's right for wrong, but it was also about the black community. I grew up singing Essence Magazine and Jet in my home, but I also saw the Dallas Weekly. My aunt had a dream that I would work for uh, an amazing person, that I would travel the world. I would meet several people that were very distinguished and on TV. I didn't think it was real. I thought it was just a dream. And even though I wanted to believe in the dream, I had doubt. I went off to college, came back home, and when I came back home, I uh, finished college, got a degree in uh, photography, and I was fortunate enough to have an idea that if that dream was real, Dallas Morning News was going to hire me. They said I wasn't qualified. Dallas Times Herald said I hadn't won an award. The Star Telegram said I wasn't polished and poised. I walked in there with clothes from a thrift store. I wore braids then, and I wasn't valued, I wasn't seen. I came back home with dismay and disappointment, and my mother told me, who's here, go to that paper that Anthony Davis had in, in South Dallas. It's a couple, a man and a woman, they bought this paper, and it's called the Dallas Weekly. And I remember seeing it in our home. I went to the paper, uh, called for an interview. I didn't see Vicki. I didn't see Mr. Washington, whom I lovingly call boss. But I met Stephen Scott, and Mr. Scott is here. Mr. Scott interviewed me. Mr. Scott offered me a job as a staff photographer. I really didn't think I would have been exposed to the level of my imagination. But that was just my thought. That was just my plan. And even though I was reluctant to believe in the fullness of what could be the potential, I still had a desire. Uh, Dallas Weekly connected me to a path that I didn't even foresee. At that time, you didn't meet Mr. Washington when you first started working at the Weekly. He would walk past, he would, he would look, he would greet, but your connection was Stephen Scott, it was Pierre Crenshaw, and the editors that we had. Mr. Washington would engage you when he saw fit. And even to this day, I don't know when he saw fit for me, but I have an idea it was tied to a contract and a check. <laughs> but I will share this. Uh, one of the many things that I did enjoy was realizing uh, the dream. I then realized my plan and then that what my mother and my aunts and the minister of my life taught me was the way. Not my way, God's way. 
The Dallas Weekly was the door of fulfillment that God had promised in my life. The mere fact that I hadn't finished college, I came back home to take care of my family, uh, I didn't think I would make it. I realized that Mr. James Washington was my education. He was my college degree. I sat as a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, and now 53, meeting with these individuals. I met Mr. Earl Nye taking notes. I met Tom Lazo taking notes. Mr. Washington was a man that saw color. He saw goodness. He saw greatness. He saw you, he gave you an opportunity, and he allowed you to fly. And when your wings were cut and you fell, he picked you back up. I've never had a boss like James Washington. I know many of you are speaking of him in many ways. But I want to share my boss. I wanted to, I, I, I never saw leaving the weekly. While I was there, I did so much. I met, as I stated, delegates. I met business leaders. I met Gregory Hines. We did movie screenings. We did concerts. And I remember Mr. Washington uh, having a meeting with uh, Emmett Till's mother. And for those who know me know I stuttered really bad uh, when I was younger. And when she uh, was leaving the weekly, uh, she was telling the story to Mr. Wash. She was talking about her son, and, and, and she was sharing so much. And I was in so much awe that I was meeting her. I mean, I met Rosa Parks through Mr. Washington. That weekly building is historical. It's so historical. But as she was leaving, she told Mr. Washington that she valued that he saw so many young people, uh, that she saw so many young people at the weekly, and that he was leading. And I remember him bringing me up. He said, come here, darling. You know, we all had nicknames. And um, she was, he was telling her that I stuttered. And he asked me to tell her what I did and who I was. And sounding like uh, an Elmo Fudd, I would say. <laughs> He, she gently held my face, and as she held my face, I realized the goodness of Mr. Washington. Mr. Washington didn't meet Earl Nye and kept him to himself. He didn't meet Ron Kirk and kept him to himself. He didn't meet Rosa Parks and kept him to himself. He exposed what he knew, what he learned, and what he encountered with all of us. As we talk about the different things of Mr. Washington, I'm going to share a few of mine. Mr. Washington, excuse me, he built relationships that went beyond the business card. He was a talker that communicated with active listening. He could enter a room and be seen, and then you're looking for him. When he pondered, when he wandered, and when he worried, he walked. He gave jobs to people who were from Pleasant Grove, to people from South Dallas, to North Dallas. Mr. Washington fed homeless people, whether they had nowhere to lay or nowhere to go. He placed many people on the cover story. He attended funerals with people who were homeless and that often walked the streets of South Dallas. He was a man of a heart that many want to strive to be. He shared his successes, his disappointments, and all of his rebounds. He also was one that let you know when he was good, when things were good and when it was bad, as Gordon stated. If he closed the door to his office, it could be good, it could be bad. But if he closed the door coming to the, his assistant and his door, it probably wasn't going to be good. <laughs> but I want to take this time to say I thank God for the dream. I thank God for my aunt telling the dream. I thank God for me not knowing if I believed in the dream. I thank God for allowing me to find and create my own plan. I thank God for showing me that my plan wasn't his. I thank God for allowing me to come to the Dallas Weekly. I thank God for giving me James Washington. He was the gift that God knew I needed. And I 
am grateful in my life for God's vision, the dream, the plan. And it's not just for me. There are people that I know that are not here, Caprice Roberts and Joseph Blair, but if you worked at the Dallas Weekly full-time or part-time, please stand. If you are a contractor at the Dallas Weekly, please stand. If Mr. Washington called on you to barter or to trade, please stand. I want to thank you all, because it's not just me that I stand here and speak. You may not have heard all of their stories, which I'm quite sure they all have. But I want to ask you all, it's OK, and I support everyone's vision about supporting the black press. But for me, find a Sherilyn. Find someone that's looking to be a human sponge, to be exposed, and mentor that Sherilyn. And give that Sherilyn what Mr. Washington gave me. Be blessed. Amen. Look, we're about to uh, uh, turn a corner in a second. Uh, there, let me just uh, give a little housekeeping and just let you know as we're making the shift, what's about to take place. So thank you uh, for uh, your presence and your uh, sharing with the family uh, in, this, in this occasion. And uh, for me, I apologize uh, that I did not kick off in my uh, being uh, as excited as I am about our celebrating this luminous life. I neglected to mention that uh, this is all because of uh, an amazing love from Pastor uh, Friendship West, uh, Fre Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, uh, who just extends to you amazing greetings, etc. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you'll hear something in just a second. So just know uh, that all the people who are here and serving caring for you in the midst of this is because of that kind of love and we give god praise uh, for him uh, we're going to hear something special in just a moment followed by uh, patrick and jess who are going to come up immediately following that uh, we'll have one more selection and then the voice you will hear after that will be from the reverend dr perry crenshaw the pastor of the church on the move ministries in Grand Prairie, uh, who is a personal friend and uh, just um, is, is led to be a blessing uh, to the family and to you. And so we look forward to that. And so uh, pay attention to the screens one more time. To the beloved family and friends of that icon, that legend, our beloved brother, James Washington. Please, first of all, receive my condolences, also my apologies for not being there today with you, but know that my heart is with you. My prayers have gone up to God on your behalf because James Washington, a brother beloved, will be missed. I'm speaking today for the commencement at Rust College in Mississippi, so that's why I'm not there. You know I'd be there. I love and will always honor the memory and legacy of James Washington. And so, given that, I can't help but give you two metaphors that speak to what James Washington has meant to me and to so many. Metaphor number one, I get from Jamel Hill. Jamel Hill, that bad sister journalist, Jamel Hill said that when she was attending Michigan State University, she got caught up in the vision and mission of journalism because journalists, she said, are watchdogs. I like that, watchdogs. And, and God knows we need watchdogs today. James Washington was our watchdog. What does a watchdog do? A watchdog guards and protects. A watchdog corrects anyone that crosses a line. A watchdog is one that you know has got your back. James Washington was our fearless watchdog. He was a watchdog for truth, a watchdog for justice, a watchdog for what's right, a watchdog who when the pages of the Dallas Weekly were printed, 
you knew good and well that our fearless watchdog was watching. also a journalist, the one for whom I'm named Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, after self-emancipating, knowing the importance of knowledge, Frederick Douglass, knowing self-determination through telling our own story was imperative, Frederick Douglass founded what? The North Star. The North Star? That's a metaphor. Because when you think about it, the North Star, that's that fixed celestial body that never ever moves, but it's that North Star that our beloved ancestors, when night fell, under the cover of darkness they looked up and that North Star ordered their steps and stops on their way to freedom. And so Frederick Douglass named his paper the North Star. James Washington, thank you for being our North Star, pointing the way to freedom. Thank you for being our North Star, giving us direction. Thank you for being our North Star. Because you are our North Star, the good news is, even though you will be missed, we're gonna do all we can to make sure we don't miss your legacy of being our North Star and our watchdog. Thank you, James Washington. Thank you to the family and friends of James Washington for sharing him with us. James Washington, that's it right there. James Washington, watchdog. James Washington, North Star. Y'all, we're gonna miss him, but may we never miss his liberating legacy as our watchdog and our North Star. God bless you. I mean, uh, in celebrating Dad with us, uh, obviously it is a great loss, um, and we are feeling it all the time, but as you can see in this room and beyond, there is a ton of him left, and we will continue that legacy uh, happily. And in that spirit, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, how to honor the legacy of Jim Washington and what to do. And we have been having those same conversations. And so just as an announcement here, thanks to the great efforts of Ms. Uh, Jade Tenner, we have founded the James A. Washington Foundation, which will support uh, a journalism uh, scholarship. And we are in talks with Paul Quinn to establish a journalism school on the campus and the saturation to the uh, communications department. In addition to that, uh, the New Dallas Weekly building we have purchased and we are looking to do some legacy work there too. So there will be links and things like that to support the renovations of this building. We will be housing uh, our, what do we call her? Uh, Carrie, who also loved Dad and couldn't be here and says <laughs> her lodges. But some of the local journalism startups, we will be housing them in for an incubator to continue that legacy of partnership and uh, collaboration within the community. So. That's what we really came to tell you, but just a few words, because I know you're waiting for them. Uh, <laughs> Dad uh, was everything everybody has said he is. He was a talker, he cared, he loved, he was a man of faith, he never wavered on his principles or values, and he taught us all that as well. His legacy is tossing a ball over there, looking very disinterested, but uh, we have vowed and planned and strategized around making sure that that name, his legacy, the Dallas Weekly, and all that he stood for is not forgotten or left behind. And so we thank you all for the, joining us in that commitment. I'm not going to do the tears thing. There was a live stream in Atlanta if you want to see those. But uh, we will be having what we're calling a story couch, too. Uh, this is not going to be the last thing we do to honor Dad. We will be having JW Day. Uh, 
on his birthday, which will be a celebration of black media, him, his legacy, but we will be having stories being told because some of them cannot be told in a church that uh, at this moment, but they're all very wonderful and good to hear. And we're putting together a story series, a part of his memorial book, which we will take some time to do what we got to do and pour, we do more of that. But that'll be all available for you to sort of, and none of that money is going to go to us. It'll all go towards the foundation because we'll be selling this memorial book, uh, the scholarship and the school. Um, because as you know, dad cycled money through like that. So did you want to say anything? Okay. I'm brave. So hello everybody. I also want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, before we even got out here, um, I was talking with Charles O'Neill and he was joking about the fact that, you know, I have really big shoes to fill as the CEO of the Dallas Weekly. Um, I didn't really even realize until dad passed, like how much he impacted exactly who I am today. Um, not just because I had his grandchildren, but also because I knew that the work that I was going to do as a CEO was going to go beyond what we put out. You know, um, That's why I'm so proud to do the things that I do in community and the ideas that I have to celebrate black people because I knew how important it was for him to do more than just tell a story. We had to live it as well. And so I just wanted to say that, Dad, I thank you for teaching me to be the leader that I am today. And I will always look back for you. I'll always be talking to you. And I think that the thing that everybody talked about today is that I will miss hearing him tell stories. I remember I used to like kind of belabor. I remember he used to call and be like, oh my God, Dad's calling. But <laughs> now I really, really, really know that I'm going to miss that the most. So we will carry on and we will celebrate. And uh, that's it. I love you, Dad. Don't 
understand May the service I give Speak for me The works I've done It seems so small Sometimes it seems like Seems like Seems like I've done nothing at all But when I stand before my God I want to hear Him say Well done May the life and service I live May the life and service He live And service to thee Speak for me Hallelujah, hallelujah And Lord, what a mighty God we serve Thank God for Pastor Frederick Douglas Haynes, amen, in his absence. Thank for the able leadership of Pastor William White. Can we show some love? For real. He's been running all over the sanctuary. He's been doing everything possible to, to get us together. And we thank you, man. We appreciate you so, so very much. I know the, the hour is late. Time is far spent. So I'm going to get up here and do what I've been assigned to do, get out the way. But as I listen to all of the selections, listen to the resolutions, and listen to the remarks, I realize how much I really loved Jim Washington myself. I really did. And the thing that makes me realize that I love him very, very much is that I'm standing here in a pulpit on a memorial service with a lime green shirt on right. and an avocado pocket <laughs> when, when I know better <laughs> Ambassador Kirk because Pastor Zan Wesley Holmes Jr. was my mentor and I'm supposed to have a black suit on black tie white shirt but because I love Jim Washington so much and the family chose green as the color, I got a lime green shirt on, y'all. And an avocado pocket filler. That ain't nothing but love. Can I get a witness in this place? Hallelujah. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we lift you up and glorify your name. Why, God? Because you're so worthy to be praised. God, if we had a thousand tongues, no 10,000 tongues, it would still not be adequate enough to give you the praise, the honor, and glory that you so rightfully deserve. But Lord, we're going to take this one tongue that we have and use it to magnify and glorify your holy and your righteous name. Father, we pray now in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, that Lord, you just have your way. Use me, oh God, to share something with this congregation today that Lord will first edify you but also Lord God will build up your people Father we ask this now in Jesus' name we pray let all who agree say amen do me a favor and stand you've been sitting for a while uh, and in the tradition of the Church on the Move Ministries, we stand when the Word of God is read anyway. So this is a good opportunity. You can go ahead and stretch a little bit if you need to turn to the right and you don't know, need to bend down. You know how those knees get when they, come on somebody, y'all know when those knees sit for too long and that back, y'all need to stretch and do what you need. I don't know why y'all playing, but okay. Amen. John, the 14th chapter. Uh, verses 1 through 6. Remain stand if you can. God bless you. John 14, verses 1 through 6. Very familiar passage of scripture. This is how it reads. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also 
in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the readers, the hearers, but especially the doers of his word. Put a tag on this text before you take your seats. Put a tag on this text before you take your seats uh, for our topic today. A heavenly promotion for Jim Washington's earthly devotion. You may take your seats in the presence of Almighty God. Touch your neighbor on the left or right and say, neighbor, oh neighbor. This afternoon we're going to talk about a heavenly promotion for Jim Washington's earthly devotion. Turn to your other neighbor on the other side on him like the way they looked at you. Turn to the other neighbor in front of you or behind you and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, this afternoon we're going to talk about a heavenly promotion for Jim Washington's earthly devotion. Let's see what thus saith the Lord. I don't know if you know it or not, but the Salvation Army never lists those who have died under the heading of deaths. Salvation Army never lists those who have died under the headings of death. They list those who have died under the heading of promotions. And the reason that they do this is because they understand that one, there is life after death. I don't know if that's a news flash to some of you all. But there is life after death. So they don't call, they don't head those who have died as death, they head them as promotions. But there's another reason, there's another reason why they use the word promotions instead of death. Because they realize that those who die, and who die in Jesus Christ, have been promoted to heaven because they have been devoted to God here on this earth. I think I just said something. I said the reason that they do this is because one, they understand that there is life after death. But number two, they do this because they know that those who die, who die in Christ Jesus, have been promoted to heaven because they have been devoted to God here on this earth. Well, on April the 2nd, 2024 here on earth in Atlanta, Georgia James Jim A. Washington took his last breath here on this earth but check this out he took his first breath in heaven because he got a heavenly promotion for his earthly devotion now, now what's interesting to me about this promotion is that it wasn't given to him by some school. The promotion that he received didn't come from Southern University. It didn't come from the University of Wisconsin Madison. No, it didn't even come from some professional organization like the National Association of Black Journalists or the National Newspaper Publishers Association or the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce or the Federal Reserve Bank's Small Business and Agricultural Ad Ad Advisory uh, Co Committee or the Dallas Metropolitan Club of Negro Business and Professional Wisdom. No, 
It didn't come from some school. It didn't come from some professional org. It didn't even come from some civic organization like the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas or the Dallas Commu Commission on Race and Relations or the NAACP or the Martin Luther King Jr. Center. No! didn't come from a school, didn't come from a, a professional organization or a civic order. It didn't even come from some entertainment group. Didn't come from the Dallas Black Dance Theater or the Dallas Museum of Arts or the State Fair of Texas or the Dallas Arbore Arboretum or KKDA and KRLD radio stations. No! didn't come from a, a school or a professional organization or civic organization or some entertainment group. And guess what? It didn't even come from some sorority or didn't come from some fraternity. Didn't come from AKA. Didn't come from Alpha, 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 Phi, Alpha. Didn't come from the Lynx Incorporated. The dollar, guess what? No, it didn't come from either one of them. It didn't even come from the business community. Didn't come from the Dallas Weekly. Didn't come from the Atlanta Vance and Voice. No, it didn't come from any of those entities this promotion that Jim received came from God himself the promotion that James received came from the creator of the universe the sustainer of the universe can I, the one who keeps the universe in its axis can I get a witness in this place now I don't know about you but that's a real promotion can I get a witness it was based and it was based on his earthly devotion to Jesus Christ now do me a favor and touch your neighbor and ask them this very serious question. Say, neighbor, y'all turn to your neighbor. Quick, quick, come on, y'all know I'm a preacher, come on. Turn to your neighbor, look them dead in the eye. Say, neighbor, have you devoted your life to Jesus Christ? Turn to your neighbor on the other side and say, neighbor, I got a question to ask you. I know we're here for a memorial service. We're here to honor, amen, and highlight the life and the legacy of Jim James Washington. But I got a question to ask you. Have you devoted your life to Jesus Christ? Well, guess what? You also need to tell me, if you have not, you better hurry up. You know why you better hurry up? Because one day you too are going to take your last breath. You're going to take your last breath on this earth. And guess what? You don't know and I don't know when that last breath will be. Can I get a witness in this place? So you better make up in your mind. Amen. To devote your life to Jesus Christ. Why? You probably are asking the question to Jesus. Why did oh, Jim, excuse me, devote himself to Jesus Christ while he was here on this earth. Well, well, the first reason I believe that he did it because he knew that earth was not his home. I wish I had some help in here this, this, this afternoon. See, Jim knew for sure that this earth was not his home. See, Jim Washington loved this world, especially Dallas. Jim Washington loved this world and he loved the people in this world. And guess what? This world loved Jim Washington. And the people in it loved Jim Washington too. Why did they love him? Because he was non-judgmental. You can always get an objective or another perspective by talking to Jim Washington. Why did they love him? He was a great communicator because he talked and he also listened. My, my, my grandmama would say, that's why God gave you, what, two ears and one mouth because you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. He was a bridge builder, not a bridge destroyer. That's why they loved him. He was a great husband. He was a great father. He was a great grandfather. He he loved Janice. He loved Elena. He loved Patrick. He loved uh, 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 James Spencer. He loved Penelope. He loved Wisdom, uh, William. He loved them and they loved him. He didn't speak unkind words about other people and he wouldn't let you do it in his presence. He made, and check this out, a lot of folks love because he made a mean banana pudding. Okay. 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 I don't know why James didn't ever... Give me any banana. <laughs> but that's but look at this, y'all. As much as Jim Washington loved this world, 
and the people in it, and as much as this world loved him, and the people in it did too, he still knew that this earth was not his home. He knew that we are strangers, my God, and we're sojourners here on this earth. So you know what he did? He took seriously when Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He knew that one of those mansions belonged to him. And he, and, he, and he looked forward to the time when he would be at home with his father. So one, we know that Jesus, that, that Jim devoted himself to Jesus Christ here on this earth because he knew that this earth was not his home. There's another reason. There's another reason. It's because he knew that his home had been prepared by Jesus Christ. One, he knew that this earth was not his home, but he also know, knew that the home that he was going to had been prepared for by Jesus Christ. You see in the text, Jesus told us to the listeners, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That uh, uh, that where I am, there you may be also. See, Jim knew that Jesus had gone on to uh, before him to prepare a home for him. But he also knew that his home would be a place where Jesus was. Y'all missed that. On the one hand, he was excited about the fact that he had a home. Are y'all hearing me? And then secondly, he was excited about the fact that his home had been prepared for by Jesus Christ. But that wasn't enough for Jim because Jim also knew that the home that had been prepared for him was also the same home where Jesus resided. I think I just said something. It, it, it was not good enough that Jim knew he had, this earth was not his home. It wasn't good enough for the fact that he knew that Jesus had prepared a home for him. He wasn't satisfied with the fact until he knew that the home where he was going to live out throughout eternity was going to be the same place where Jesus was. The same place where Jesus is. Ah, oh, y'all a tough crowd today. And I knew you were going to be a tough crowd today. Holy Spirit dropped it in my spirit. Say, Pastor Crenshaw, you're going to deal with a tough crowd today. But I got something for you. See, one day, because I've given my life to Jesus Christ, a long time ago, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, invited him in to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Bless his high and holy name and guess what because I've invited Christ into my life and said Lord you be my savior and Lord you be my Lord guess what one day I'm going to spend eternity with you in heaven now check this out when I get to heaven my grandfather Perry Hollins my namesake whom I'm named after he'll be there See, when I get to heaven, my grandmother will be there. When I get there, my sister, Lisa Crenshaw, who died 37 years ago, she'll be there. When I get there, boy, my God, my father, Willie Newton Crenshaw, which, which, which I get the end in my middle name uh, from, he, he'll also be there. My wife, Pierre Crenshaw, God rest her soul, who died three years ago after 38 years of marital bliss as well as blizzard, she'll be there. Can I get a witness in this place? Jim Washington is the same one who gave Pierre Crenshaw a job when she was without work for a long period of time and she was pregnant, can I get a witness, with a, one of our children and we already had three on the way and she had, and Jim Washington asked her, when you have the baby, are you going to leave me or are you going to come back? And she said, because you've been so kind to me, when I have this child, I'm coming back. Can I get, that's what I'm saying. Jim, Pierre Crenshaw will be there, but guess what? When I get to heaven, and I see the streets paved with gold.
and I see my loved ones. Can I get a witness? And I see the beautiful mansion that God has prepared for me. If I don't see Jesus, y'all miss your shouting cue. I can see the streets of gold. I can see all of my loved ones and friends. I can see the mansion that he has prepared for me. But if I don't see Jesus, I'm going to turn around. Because if there's a heaven without Jesus, I don't want to be there. I know you're tired. I know you're tired. I know you're tired. Last, certainly not least. Why did Jim Washington devote himself to Jesus Christ while he was on this earth? You know what y'all are asking? Some good questions this afternoon. One reason, another reason why he devoted his life to Jesus Christ while he was on this earth is because he knew that, he, that Jesus Christ was the only way to get home. You do know that was your shouting cue. For all who are in Christ Jesus, that, that was your shouting cue. See, one, he knew that earth was not his home. Two, he knew that his home had been prepared by Jesus and is the place where Jesus inhabits. But three, he knew that Jesus, come on somebody, was the only way to get to the home that had been prepared for him. In our text, Jesus tells his listeners that they knew where he was going and that they also knew the way. Then Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, said, Lord, we don't know where you are going and how, Lord, can we know the way? Jesus replied to, to Thomas and said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jim knew that Jesus was the only way to get to the home that Christ had prepared for him. As I close this thing out, over the years, I was one of the ones that Jim Washington would call. He would call me on the phone. Sometimes when we saw each other in public, we would have some deep biblical or some deep theological or some hyper spiritual. <laughs> I like that. Some hyper spiritual conversation. And over the years, some of you, some of the, some folks don't know it. Over the years, Jim Washington would come to the church that I pastored right there off of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, Warren United Methodist Church. And Jim, Jim participated in a, in a 34 week in-depth, come on somebody, Bible study right there in the classroom of Warren United Methodist Church. Uh, uh, over the years, Jim and I, I, I like this picture, amen, because cause this picture right here, amen, uh, looks like Jim is kind of preaching just a little bit. Y'all can act like y'all don't see it if you want to. He has a microphone. I got a microphone. He has his hand raised up. Can I get a witness? And it looks like he's preaching the word of God. See, Jim and I talked about the call that he had on his life. Jim and I talked about the commission that God had on his life. And you know what I realized? Kelvin Bass, you know what I realized? And what the Holy Spirit showed me as I was in time of prayer, pondering, and preparation? You know what Jim was really doing? What Jim was really doing by asking me those deep biblical, theological, and hyper spiritual conversations? You know what Jim was really doing when he was spending time uh, in God's Word for 34 weeks? over two or three years can I get a witness you know what Jim was really doing I wish I had some help in here today when, when he would talk about the call 
that God had on his life. And he talked about the commission that God was preparing him for. You know, the Holy Spirit said to me, what Jim was really doing was making sure that he knew as much as he could about the way, come on somebody, that was going to take him to heaven. I wish I had some help in here today. Somebody say, yeah. Say yeah. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for raising me. Thank you, Lord, for protecting me. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. Thank you, Lord, for being a bridge over troubled water. Thank you, Lord, for being a shelter in time of storm, being a rock in a weary land. Can I get a witness in this place? Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Thank you for Jim James A. Washington. Thank you, God, for giving him a heavenly promotion for his earthly devotion to you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen to God, to God, to God, to God, be the glory for all, for all, for all that he has done, every blessing, for every mountain, every you brought me over yes. for every storm every you've storm. seen me through. Hallelujah. I open up my mouth yes. and give you praise. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. A heavenly promotion, yeah, Come on. for James Washington's earthly devotion. Yeah. Can, can we give the uh, give a hand to the Lord again for the word, yes. this eulogy Hallelujah. from Pastor Perry Crenshaw, and even in the midst of the eulogy, gave a, a, a challenge, a little bit of an invitation uh, that perhaps someone would benefit from responding to, because. The great thing is he talked about all the persons that he would see when he makes his way to glory, all in his family and to see Jim again. Uh, and the idea is, is that it'd be great to see you in that space when your last breath, last breath is taken down here and your first one is taken in glory. But it's hard to get a promotion for an organization to which you don't belong. Let me say it again. Uh, I, I wouldn't get, uh, as, a, as an alumni of Florida and a and University, I, I wouldn't get uh, a promotion, as it were, uh, at, at Southern. I wouldn't get it there because it's hard to get a promotion to a place, an organization to which you don't belong. The awesome thing is, is that you can be a part of this amazing and incredible this, uh, this gift of the body of Christ, this redemptive organization, this place where God desired for your presence to be part of what he's up to, so much so, he gave his best. Yeah, we saw a great thing in Jim, but we saw his best in Jesus. He gave his best to die for us so that we could live for God. If you have never accepted that gift, we're we going to be like Jim. We're not going to talk about you. We're not going to put you down. We're not going to say anything bad about you. Here's what we're going to do, though. We want to be able to pray for you. And so here's what I'm going to ask you all to do. Just right where you are, if you would just take a moment, just bow your head, close your eyes. For those of you who know what we're talking about by way of this invitation, perhaps you can be praying for someone even right now. What an amazing, incredible outcome for somebody who made it to the memorial of Jim to get to know the one that Jim gave his earthly devotion to. And so here's what we want to ask you. If you don't know this Jesus, matter of fact, if you don't know if you were to die today, which is unfortunately a real possibility, if you're not clear 
that you know the way, the truth, and the life, if you're not absolutely certain that when you take your last breath down here, that your first breath in heaven will be the next inhale that you would make, then the awesome thing is, is you can, we can help you with that today. All you have to do is just lift up your hand because we want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you to get connected to this way, this truth and this life, without whom nobody makes it to the one who is the way preparer. Amen. God, how we thank you for the amazing blessing of James Washington, but we thank you for the incredible gift of Jesus. Thank you that you gave your best for us. Thank you that you made a way for us. And thank you for each person, God, already who has their ticket punched, but for those who want to be a part of your amazing operation so they can have that heavenly, devo heavenly promotion for this earthly devotion. God bless in an amazing way. Encourage and uplift. We give you praise and thanks for all you're going to do. Pour back in to Pastor Crenshaw. Bless this family in an amazing way. We thank you for each one who's here. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give a hand one more time for the word. What a celebration of life. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, we're about to have, uh, I'll be serenaded uh, one more time by none other but than the phenomenal uh, Verlinda Stanton. Can y'all give her, uh, God praise for her even before she comes? Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to make our way as she is serenading us with the recession. We're going to greet the family briefly and have them make their way to the place where we're going to have a repast in the outside and where we mentioned earlier. You'll be able to meet and greet them. So please uh, enjoy that music as it's about to come and then follow along after us after you see the family has made their way. You're able to remain here and enjoy and then come on and join us afterwards. All right. If you want to know where I'm going, where I'm going. If anybody asks you where I'm going, where I'm going soon, oh, I'm going up yonder, I'm going up yonder. the pain and the heartaches they bring the comfort they know we I'll soon be gone if God gives me grace I'll run this way See my Savior you where I'm going 